Only five games on tonight's slate for Daily Fantasy Baseball, which means there aren't a ton of spots to turn for upside. And that's kind of a bummer because there are some situations, some pitchers, some stacks where we typically want to pivot if they're going to be popular on a larger slate. I'm just not sure if we really have that option given the way things break down for today. So we'll talk about those options, talk about why they have some riskiness to them, whether we have options elsewhere and how to handle all that and getting you ready for a Thursday night slate. Welcome on into the solo shot. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire here to break down Thursday's five-game main slate with locks up for 7.07 p.m. Eastern, for today, there are three weather spots on the slate where things could be a little bit dicey. Let's start things off in St. Louis between the Cardinals and the Astros. Isolated thunderstorms there, which means it's more likely to impact pitchers than batters. In that game, given the temperature in that game, it is very, very high. I care more about the batters than I do about the pitchers. So, I'd keep an eye and I'd check back on the weather there later on, but uh, should be okay for that one. Similar forecast in Chicago for the Cubs and the Phillies. It seems like they should be relatively good to go there as well. A little bit less coverage in Coors for the Rockies and Dodgers. Um, so could see some storms there as well. I think all these games are going to be good to go. Not super worried about pitchers in them either. So I would say check back on weather for St. Louis, for the Cardinals and Astros, Chicago for the Cubs and Phillies and Denver for the Rockies and Dodgers, but I think we should be good to go for all those spots. We'll break down the pitching options, stacks, and much more here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Also, don't forget you can find us over on the FanDuel YouTube page every weekday along with your FanDuel TV Plus app. If you don't have FanDuel TV Plus yet, check it out on Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku to get this alongside covering the spread up and Adams, run it back all the great FanDuel TV shows alongside the solo shot and covering the spread baseball season is in full swing and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel America's number one sports book because right now new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 that's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win so don't miss your chance to snag a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only, $10 deposit required. Refund issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-789. 7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in indiana 1-800-9 and with it in wyoming and kansas 1-800-522-4700 or in kansas ksgamblinghelp.com louisiana 1-877-770-STOP in massachusetts gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghealth.org. In New York, 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Pitching preview for this Thursday main slate. Max Scherzer lead things off with a salary of $9,700, followed by Taiwan Walker at $95. They are the only guys with salaries above $9,000. We got Chris Bassett, JP France, Emmett Sheehan, and Kyle Hendricks as the others at $8,000 or higher. Now, from a pitching quality perspective, Max Scherzer is definitely the best guy on this slate. And that's even if we diminish him based on his 2023 form. And that means even with some caution, I think we should use him against the Brewers for tonight. If we look at the full season, Scherzer has been fine. And fine is a step down from Max Scherzer, Max Scherzer. He has a 3.69 a skill interactive ERA. Strikeout rate is 26%, and those are both the best marks on this slate. We have seen Scherzer also have higher upside showings recently. He has eight-plus strikeouts and five of his past six starts, and four of those have come on the road. I just don't see enough difference in the profile for Scherzer, what he's doing now versus what he was doing earlier on, to omit those earlier season struggles. So to me, the most relevant sample on Scherzer is all 13 starts, and 
that is not as impressive as what he's been doing recently. But I do still think, A, we should view him that way. And B, it's going to be the best option for tonight. Swing and strike rate for Scherzer is 14%, which means his strikeout rate could trend up a bit more. And the Brewers have a 24% strikeout rate against righties. We should like that too. So Scherzer is definitely not spotless, and you can consider going away from him. But straight up, he's going to be the top option for tonight, just because I don't think we really have a lot of other options to go elsewhere. We've had starts where Scherzer's been the chalk and blown up. That could happen again tonight, but I think given the lack of great alternatives, Max Scherzer is going to be the top option for MLB DFS for tonight. Number two, I'm probably going to wind up on Taiwan Walker behind Scherzer. Walker is also on the road, but he's facing the Cubs, and they've definitely cooled off from what they were doing earlier on this year. The WRC plus of the Cubs against righties down to 102. They have just a 136 ISO, which is the lowest on the slate. Walker is trending the opposite direction. He just seems a lot more locked in now than what he was earlier on this year. Walker's let up zero or one runs in four consecutive starts. And he has had some plus matchups in there, and that's worth noting, but he also did face the Dodgers and did face the Mets. When he's faced lesser teams, we saw Walker get eight strikeouts both times. And this is tied to a shift for him because Walker has been throwing more splitters in this sample, and his velocity has, at times been up from where it was earlier this year. That part I'm not sure about. The velocity, I'm not sure if it'll stick, because it did go down his last time out, but it does seem like the confidence for Walker in the splitter is up, and that's a good thing, because that's kind of like the catalyst pitch for him that determines how well he does on a given night. There is shakiness for Walker, too, which is why I don't like him as a pivot without knowing what projected roster rates look like, but if you get the vibe that Scherzer will be too popular for your liking... I think Walker does enough to be viable. He's also not perfect, but there's enough there to me to make him worth thinking about. So to me, I'm going to go Scherzer one. I'm going to go Walker two. It's hard to find great alternatives on this slate. So to me, I'll just go with the two best guys, the two guys in the best form. And to me, those guys are Max Scherzer and Taiwan Walker in that order. Talking up Chris Bassett in the third spot means we're discussing each of the top three guys in salary, but he is a value play. And it is kind of boring. I just don't think we have a lot of choice. So Bassett will be my number three. He's at home against the Giants, and they're a good offense. They have a 116 a WRC plus against righties, which is highest on the slate. So a very good offense. But they do strike out 23% right there. So they're not a team where opponents against them are devoid of upside if they can keep the ball in the yard. Bassett might be able to do that. Kind of had a weird year so far. He started off super slow, then hit a really nice stride. But his past three starts, he's gotten worked over, and two of those were in tough spots, but the final one was against the A's at home. And this wonkiness for Bassett does correlate with the shift in his approach. He's been throwing more changeups his past six starts, and his ERA in that time is 6.89. But his skill interactive ERA is much better at 4.26. He's not walking a lot of guys. Strikeout rate is fine. Bassett's just letting up way too much hard contact. And... It's a small sample, so that number could get better. And it keeps me from thinking that he's totally broken. I don't think a couple bad starts indicates Bassett is back to where he was at the early part of the year. But it is why he's third. It's why I don't view there as being a great pivot away from Scherzer or Walker for tonight. So I don't think you necessarily need to get here. I think if you wanted to go all in on Scherzer and Walker, that's fine. Uh, overall, it's kind of a weird slate. So to me, I think I'm going single entry primarily just to kind of, you know, avoid the, you know, more than one entry, but in single entry contests, uh, going separate lineups across those. I think that's the ideal way to play things for tonight. So to me, it's Scherzer one, Walker two, largely because I don't have great pivots available on this slate. So I'll just ride with them and hope that popularity doesn't get too high and that they can not implode on tonight's slate. Stacking is a bit easier. It's not perfect either, but it is a little bit better. Starting off with the Dodgers, they're at Coors Field one more night. They're facing Adam Wainwright in this one, and I think we got the green light to go back to the Dodgers, or they're facing Chase Anderson, uh, I should say. Adam Wainwright's the next stack. Um, Anderson, I think we got the green light here. He started off really well in the rotation, good results in his first five starts, but peripherals in that time were still pretty underwhelming. And I think we've seen that play out recently where you kind of get why the peripherals were not coming around. Anderson has not lasted five innings for three consecutive starts. 
He's let up seven runs in one and nine in another. He's also let up multiple home runs in four of his past five starts. And two of those games were on the road. In the two starts that Anderson's made at Coors Field, he's let up a combined five home runs and 12 earned runs. If we look at the seven starts where Anderson has been fully stretched out, he has a 5.15 skill interactive ERA with a 15% strikeout rate. The batted ball data is still pretty good despite the home runs, and that does matter. That's why he can have some good starts occasionally, but it's also not enough to scare me off. The Dodgers lead this slate in ISO. They lead it in fly ball rate, and you put that in a plus match at Coors Field, it's too good for me to pass up. So the Dodgers at Coors are the number one stack once again for tonight. It is a small sample, but Anderson has seemed to struggle more with lefties and righties to a decent extent. The batted ball data worse there. A lot of line drives, fewer ground balls. And typically when I'm ranking out the Dodgers for stacking, even against a righty, I'm looking at Mookie Betts, J.D. Martinez, Will Smith as being the top guys with a hair above Freddie Freeman. Here, I might want to go Freeman number one or Max Muncy, given he's back from the IL now, uh, just because that platoon advantage seems a bit more impactful in this matchup than it is for others. So I still love the righties. Definitely no, no reason to be worried about them, but I think Freeman gets a boost. Muncy gets a boost, assuming he's back in there for tonight. I think last night was kind of a schedule night off for him off the IL. So <clears throat> I would go bump those guys up relative to where you typically have them compared to the righties uh, within your Dodger stacks. It is 104 degrees tonight in St. Louis, and that is great for hitting. Adam Wainwright, promises actually him this time, has struggled thus far uh, and is facing the Astros. And I don't think the Astros are a good offense right now, but I do think we should give them a look here. Wainwright has made nine starts since he returned from the IL, and he's still really struggling. He has a 6.56 ERA. His expected ERA is actually a bit worse than that, is 6.84. Wainwright's not letting up a lot of hard contact, but he's still getting just trucked regardless. I think it's because he's letting up too many balls in play, so it erases the good things he does elsewhere. Wainwright let up seven runs to the Cubs last week. That game was at home, and now he gets another mid-level offense. And I think that makes the Astros a good enough stack to consider here uh, for tonight, given the hot temperatures and given Wainwright's struggles. The one downside with this stack, I would say, is that Wainwright has struggled more with lefties, and there's probably going to be just one lefty in the lineup for tonight for the Astros and Kyle Tucker. I think that does mean Kyle Tucker deserves to be like the key priority here. Uh, Tucker hasn't been as great this year as he was last year, but his expected Woba is actually higher than it was. He's still stealing bases, can still hit dingers. So to me, Tucker is the top guy to prioritize within these stacks just because the platoon splits for Wainwright do lead us there. Um, I, I think that that's the main thing. Bly Madras is another lefty who could potentially be in there. He got the start last night. Minimum salary did okay in that start last night. So if he's back in there, maybe you want to go there too as another lefty. But I think that Tucker, the main benefactor of the platoon splits of Adam Wainwright. The final stack is going to be the Mets. They're facing Adrian Hauser. And Hauser has been clinging to a spot in the rotation. His past winnings have actually been in relief. And looking in the peripherals, it kind of helps you understand why he's been struggling to, to hold that spot, even though the results have been largely okay. Hauser has been, has been using fewer splitters across his past seven outings, including those two in relief. And in that time, he has a 4.97 skill interactive ERA with a 13% strikeout rate. His batted ball data, kind of like Wainwright, is not hideous, but and that's likely why he has some decent outings. But he has let up five plus runs twice. And I think based on the peripherals, blow up outings are very much within the range of outcomes for Hauser. The Mets, uh, 107 WRC plus against righties and a 162 ISO. I think they'll put the ball in play a ton. Whether they capitalize on that remains to be seen. So I think there's enough here to stack, enough here to feel good about them. And I will go with the Mets as the number three stack for tonight. One way to mitigate the bad of ball data is leaning on the lefties once again. Hauser's ground ball rate against lefties is 44%, whereas it's 58% against righties. So Pete Alonso not impacted. He's kind of the, he's not a righty or a lefty. You know, he's just, he's just kind of a hitter. Um, I would say that it does bump up Brandon Nimmo, Francisco Lindor, Dan Vogelbach. I think that's a net positive for this stack. So to me, bump up the lefties. Don't, neg don't really push down Alonso too much, but I think that the, the lefties do get a bump up and you can feel good about them given the way Hauser has gone so far this year. So top stacks for tonight going to be the Dodgers, Astros, and the Mets. 
Things to watch. We do have the other side of Coors Field. The Rockies facing Emmett Sheehan, who has looked awesome so far. And he was tremendous in AAA. Sheehan does let up a lot of fly balls, and the hard hit rate is not super low as of yet. So I think the Rockies are in play for stacking. They're not a good offense, but we saw last night they can go off for nine runs in certain situations. I'm willing to give them a look for one-offs and stacks here just because I do think there is enough shakiness in Sheehan's profile where we don't need to put him in like a a tier where we avoid him even at Coors Field. He's a righty. Rockies are better against righties, so I would say stacking against Sheehan is okay with the Rockies for tonight. If the weather's okay in St. Louis, again, that caveat there, I could see stacking the Cardinals on the opposing side of that game as well. We talked about uh, stacking the Astros earlier on. Cardinals facing J.P. France, who's had decent results so far, and he does look like a guy who will limit hard contact in the majors, but not a shutdown pitcher. The Cardinals, they have an offense that can have upside, so I think they're a fine consideration once again for tonight. Finally, the Blue Jays facing a likely bullpen game for the Giants. I'd expect Keaton Wynn to get some work here for the Giants. He's pitched well, both in AAA and the majors. Gets a lot of ground balls, and that's why the Blue Jays aren't super, super high on my list. Uh, They're obviously not out of play, but it's a short slate. Got to consider some people. I do respect the Giants enough when they go with this approach to not prioritize the Blue Jays uh, relative to other teams we discussed earlier on. Let's finish up here. The dinger calls for today. Mentioned before that Sheehan does let up a lot of fly balls. Let's go to a Rockies batter for our boring home run call. We got to go Nolan Jones. Jones has shown a ton of power so far this year. It seems pretty legitimate, I would say. Uh, Salary $3,800 on FanDuel for tonight. Hasn't hit one in about a week. So I think that Nolan Jones, a fun home run call for today, will make him the top boring dinger call of the night. For the fun one, I don't typically regard Brandon Nimmo as being a, a power hitter, but had a double dog a couple nights ago. That's not the lone reason why he's here, but Nimmo, if you look at him in the month of June, launch angle is up, hitting a lot of barrels. It seems like maybe he's been tweaking his approach in order to get more fly balls, take advantage of the hard contact that he makes, and it's paid off pretty well so far. So I think Nimmo is actually a really fun one as far as being underappreciated from a DFS perspective. Maybe this is just like projection where I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't think that Nimmo was that good for DFS. And now I'm suddenly shocked by it. So maybe it's all projection. Maybe you appreciate Nimmo more than I do, but regardless, we'll make him uh, the dinger call for today. So the dinger call is going to be Nolan Jones and Brandon Nimmo for tonight. That is all that we have here for today on the solo shot. As always, want to remind you to make sure you're subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on podcast or Spotify. And again, check out the show on the FanDuel YouTube page or on FanDuel TV+. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your MLB DFS lineups. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down Friday's slate. This has been the solo shot right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.